Six, who is going to present the colors and lead us in the pledge today. Yeah, wherever. <coughs> All right, if I could have everybody rise, face the flag. Awesome, thank you. And can I have you gentlemen come up to the front here and we'll take a picture? All right, thank you, gentlemen. All right, call the roll, please. Trustee Sperling. Here. Trustee Lee. Here. Trustee Hines. Here. Trustee Youngerman. Here. Trustee Marisek. Here. Trustee Bond. Here. All right, we're all here this evening. Uh, moving along to uh, public participation, thank you. Uh, we had the flag ceremony by the Cub Scout Pack 316, and now we will have... Um, Let's go out of order just a little bit. We'll do item C, which is recognition of Mike Murphy. Uh, Public Works employee Michael J. Murphy would like to turn it over to Director Hoppenstead. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, tonight, we'd like to recognize Public Works employee Michael J. Murphy for being um, what I would call customer service excellence. Mike was hired in April of 2004. He consistently delivers customer service excellence that far exceeds his job description. Mike is always willing to help out others regardless of the task at hand. His daily commitment to Montgomery Public Works is exemplary. Specifically, I want to draw attention to uh, Mike's duties as a Julie locator throughout the Metronet infrastructure deployment over the past year. This project was initially scheduled to take two years to execute. However, it was completed in just 11 months, due in part to Mike's ability to efficiently process Julie Locates, at times hundreds per day. Uh, Mike's close communication with the contractors in the field and his ability to identify efficiencies in the program led to an earlier completion date. Furthermore, Mike took the initiative to review the plans for each segment of installation and consider how that installation may unknowingly affect the residents of Montgomery. Numerous times throughout the project, Mike would involve me and the necessary representatives from Metronet to discuss potential impacts on private property prior to installation. In addition to the village's utilities, Mike was concerned about the impacts on private areas of enhanced landscape, fences, sheds, pets, swimming pools, etc. Utility locating is typically a process that only occurs right before the construction commences. However, Mike also went above and beyond to review many areas of installation on private property after the construction had been completed. This quality assurance is not a component of Mike's job description. However, he wanted to help relieve the potential frustrations of Montgomery homeowners in reviewing and addressing any issues often before the residents had even questioned the quality of work. 
Please join me in thanking Mike Murphy for his commitment to customer service excellence as we present him with this unique award tonight. If I may, I'd also like to point out that many of his coworkers have come to recognize him tonight, so thank you. Yes, I was just going to also say that uh, it really means a lot, you know, to have uh, members of the Public Works family here this evening as well. So thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your life. You can certainly stay for the whole thing. I'm sure it'll be riveting, uh, but you can also take off. We won't be offended. So thank you. Appreciate it. I'm going to go back up to uh, item B, uh, public comment. This is a two-minute opportunity. Is there any member of the public that's here today that would like to address the board? All righty. We have at least one. If you could just, uh, if you haven't signed in, sign in and just state your name and address. Timing is everything. Had you asked that right before they all stood up? Yeah. Public Works employees I met a month ago, so uh, since they're still almost in the room. Uh, my name is Brent Wilson. I've been a resident for 13 years. Uh, recently this summer moved to Liquor Creek West, and I'm here to talk today about the uh, flooding that we had a month ago, almost a month exactly ago. Um, I wanted to bring a, I guess, eyewitness account of what happened and also implore that the village board could do something for us to remedy the situation and make it uh, not happen again in the future, or at least not have as much damage as we see, like we've seen last time. Um, so I've got some photos. Unfortunately, I don't know that I can really show them all to you all at the same time. They're not really, like it's a ni nice panoramic spread I have here, but I'm gonna have to walk around. But is that okay? Can I walk? Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So what you see here is a series of photos that I'll walk around a couple times to show. You've got a panoramic view, basically, of the combat easement area between those on there between. Uh, 30 and oh, backwards order. Between Route 30 and Truman Avenue, Truman Lane, Truman Drive, Truman Drive. Um, and you'll see, and I'll shuffle these along the circle, that the water basically comes up all the way to the backs of these houses that are on Liquor Creek West. This is a separate photo I'll point out and talk to you directly. This is the back, this is off my roof by just standing up and taking photos of the back of my roof. You can see the water up against the houses. And what we're seeing here is Sandbags are provided by the Public Works Department, so again, I really appreciate all their assistance. I'm sitting on my roof looking north, and the road back there is Route 30. Um, so anyhow, the, uh, so anyway, the, my account of what happened was, storm obviously happened that we all are aware of, it's about the 13th, I think, of October. Uh, there were seven some inches of rainfall in 24 hours, which is a lot. Um, but I didn't expect my backyard to fill all the way up, and I didn't expect all my neighbors to fill up. And I want to say that I think almost every house, if not every house, on the eastern edge of Liquor Creek West had flooded basements or basements that were only not flooded because our pumps were strong enough to keep up with an inordinate amount of water coming in. I mean, the, the problem here is it seems clearly an insufficient drainage issue where the, the basements are basically floating in maybe five feet of water. Water's coming in from the walls, water's coming in from the, from the floor, from into the sump pits. It was, it's unreasonable to expect a commercial sump pump or off-the-shelf residential sump pump to keep up with that amount of water ingress. It seems like that uh, the problems clearly could be addressed with 
better drainage from that storm basin down to the next downstream basin. I didn't see any other, any other homes in the area downstream. I took a long walk uh, that seemed at all as threatened as, as we were. So again, I'd like to appreciate all the uh, support we got while we were in this problem and also request that you guys can do your best to use available funds to make an improvement. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Brent. And were you at the meeting? Uh, I think it was October 22nd. Were you able to come to that one? Or? Uh, I was not. I was not okay. at that meeting. And I think we... Sorry, I'm really loud. Uh, I think we're talking about that. Um, I have an update here in front of me, but we did talk about it that evening, so that is on YouTube just to hear what the conversation from that evening. Uh, but it's something we're taking very seriously, and we'll continue to, to talk about um, I guess the benefit is that now we're headed into the winter season, and so we have some time to actually analyze, take a good look at it. So, Yeah, I wouldn't expect anything to happen before the winter, and I'm just crossing my fingers that nothing like this happens until mm -hmm. it's time to be fixed. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other resident wishing to address the board? Rather than repeat pictures and whatnot, um, we were definitely a home that took on water. Uh, weren't aware there was even a water issue, and I guess <coughs> several years back there was in that area. Um, so going down into the basement that Saturday night, we noticed some water coming in at about 11 o'clock at night. And we're, we're looking at the sump pump, we're like, okay, we probably can handle it. Sunday came around, it was about an inch of water, standing water. We're like, sump pump's still working, pumping the water out. And it wasn't until Monday morning that we woke up about 5.30 in the morning to whistling of our furnace. And that's when we saw that the water coming into the basement was so great and the sump pump was still working, but we were now at six inches or the first step of our, our stairs in our house. So. Uh, our items that we thought were okay all day Sunday with the one inch of water seemed protected, but then by the six inches it picked up all of our Rubbermaids and dump, dumped them. Um, so the aftermath we've been, you know, definitely we had to throw some more sump pumps in to kick the water out. Really the walls of the basement had no cracks, nothing was coming through the walls. It was all coming from the basement flooring. Because uh, that first day on Sunday, when it was only the one inch, we were able to squeegee quick enough, and we saw just the water permeating from the from the ground. Um, so I do have some pictures of the internal, like what the basement was taking on. But again, we never had a a sump pump failure. It just had a sump pump failure of keeping up with the amount of water coming in through the basement floor. Mm -hmm. um, and not until you know. Until the water started receding from the back was when, when we started seeing that the basement was drying out. Otherwise, the sump pump was running continuously from Saturday night till, I'd say, Wednesday evening. Um, we did have Permaseal come out. Uh, you know, they said, this is what you can do. Uh, basically, they said, stick in a triple safe pump and basically it was three pumps within the sump pump system and uh, taking what, two PVCs out. But after we kind of thought about it, that's really what we ended up doing on that Monday morning is we added another two pumps. So what you had asked, my husband had asked them like, well, if we get this much rain though, how are we not gonna take it on? His thought was we could maybe kick it out fast. But if, again, if the, water out back isn't relieved, we're gonna probably be in the same scenario. So we're hopeful that there can be a fix out back and then we wouldn't have this issue in our basement. Uh, awesome. And my name's Andrea Arndt. Thank you. All right, thank you. And if you do wanna share those photos, you can email those to Debbie and she can pass them along to us. How many houses on Bryan do you think were affected 
with this recent storm? And then I do know there was another house on Troon. So Brian and then Troon, mm -hmm. there were the houses that backed up along the uh, retention pond back there. I know mm -hmm. of one neighbor that spoke up saying that they were having a, a, a similar water issue, that there were no cracks in the basement wall, that the water was just coming up from the ground. OK. Seven? Seven. Yeah. No, right. Right. OK. And this, and as uh, you alluded to, this is a, a similar situation happened a few years ago, and we studied the, you know, our engineers took a look at that and actually made some improvements uh, downstream of there, really to get the water out of there a little bit quicker. Um, and so, in I guess more instances than not, that seems to have been an improvement. Obviously, not great enough to help in the situation. So we're looking at it again to see what we can do. Um, but like I told you, this is something that we're um, we're looking at. And we'll talk about tonight. And uh, we'll keep you guys up to date. One more thing. Um, we have family that lives in Naperville area. And actually, they were talking about a lift station. What's it called? David Augustine. A lift station pump that mm -hmm. they have there when the rains get so great. They use, like, this water hits a certain point, and they're, they're like, taking that water that's just sitting and kicking it elsewhere. Like a, almost like a sump pump for the whole area. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Anybody else, uh, members of the public, wish to address the board? All right. We will be talking about this, uh, so I'm going to move on uh, to item D, where we have uh, Court Carlson from the Aurora Area Convention and Visitors Bureau here this evening. My name is Clark Carlson, and I am the director of the Aurora Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, since we are on the agenda today um, for our intergovernmental agreement, I just want to take a few minutes to kind of address the Village Board. And uh, first of all, certainly thank you for your support over the years with the regional tourism effort. Um, I'm happy to say that Montgomery is actually one of our original four communities that signed on <clears throat> with the tourism effort back in 1987. So we're uh, very pleased that with your um, long-standing support and hope to have you back again for another five years based on <clears throat> tonight's agreement. Um, certainly, Stewart Sports Complex here in, in Montgomery has proven to be one of um, our leading destination drivers for visitation to the area. Um, certainly, as we continue to grow our sports marketing effort, um, it is turning out to be the primary um, attraction of bringing people to the area. Certainly overnight teams that are traveling from all over the country to play uh, soccer, lacrosse, frisbee, um, baseball, softball, um, you name it, it's there. And um, very happy with the new Aurora University complex also that's coming on board and how we can promote um, the whole region based around those, those venues that are right here uh, in Montgomery and continue to drive overnight visitation to the Aurora area. I also wanted to um, just make mention of the one sheet marketing um, form that is in the back of your packet put together through our office. So this kind of talks about not only you know what we do in terms of sports marketing for Montgomery, but also how Montgomery receives benefits and attractions based on what we're doing for our social media campaigns, our marketing, and our digital, um, our digital advertising, as well as our website um, uh, promotion. So you can see there, there's a couple graphs on there and looking at what we're seeing for the share of Montgomery for our content on, on Enjoy Aurora. 7% uh, of all page views are receiving information and content based on, on Montgomery. So this, they're seeing your message on our website. And what's interesting too is, although Stewart Sports Complex is probably the primary driver for us, um, we look at the information that's being delivered to the, to the, to the consumer on Montgomery uh, Stewart Sports Complex isn't necessarily the primary driver of that information. So we give information on family fun and outdoor activities, uh, also dining and things to do in, in Montgomery, as well as sports and events in Montgomery. And that holds true, too, also on our social media. We look at social media, 10% of all of our social media content um, includes messaging for the village of Montgomery. And you look at the overall total counts and what is being delivered to, to the consumer for Montgomery um, includes the total mentions is huge, the blue line, 136,000, over 136,000 messages to the consumers. 
but South Moon Barbecue is a big portion of that. Um, the Dixon Merce Farm, and then surprisingly enough, Stewart's Ports Complex is the smallest portion of that that's being delivered. So again, while Stewart's Ports Complex is a huge destination driver for us, there's a lot more messaging for Montgomery that's being delivered to the traveling consumer through our social media, through our website, and our digital uh, content advertising. Certainly wanted to uh, thank you for your time and your long-term commitment to the Aurora Area CPB. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, otherwise, I look forward to your continued support for tourism. Awesome. Any questions for Court while he's here? Or on the IGA? Awesome. Just mention that uh, last Court and I actually participated last year in a pro-am bowling event that was hosted in, Mon in Montgomery um, over at Parkside Lanes. With I had to go out and buy He's bowling shoes the day before. <laughs> I haven't worn them since, so it's been over a year now. <laughs> oh, he wears them. So you, you're you saying you were the am and not the pro in that. A court, was, I, was it bad? Was I bad? No, you were very good. <laughs> it, it, was it was a great time, though. It was, and, I mean, it, it really was such a fun event, and the people and the fans and the kids that were there, and then to go on and watch TV the following weekend and see the people that I actually got a chance to bowl with actually bowling, that they were here in Montgomery, staying in our area. And I'm uh, Sean Rand, who's the host of that event. He's coming back again in June. He actually is from Montgomery, and he's one of the top 10 bowlers in the, in the world right now. So he was uh, he bowled for Brunswick. Um, he's based right here in Montgomery. Parkside Lanes is his local home. Uh, so we're looking forward to having him back again uh, in June of 2018. Very cool. Thank you, Court. Right. Thanks, Court. A 99 is not doing bowling. <laughs> All right, move on to the uh, consent. I'll read the items and entertain a motion for approval. Minutes of the Village Board Meeting of October 23rd. Executive Session Minutes of October 23rd. Accounts Payable through November 8th. The Building Report for October of 2017. Accounts Receivable Report for October of 2017, Cancellation of the Committee of the Whole Meeting for November 21st, and the Village Schedule of Meetings for 2018. So moved. Second. Trustee Youngerman? Yay. Trustee Marisek? Yes. Trustee Bond? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Hines? Yay. Thank you. That carries 6-0. Under items for separate action, we have the renewal of the IGA with the Aurora Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. Unless Jeff had anything to add or questions? <clears throat> Motion to approve. Second. Fine. Who was that? Oh. Trustee Mersick? Yes. Trustee Bond? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Hines? Yay. And Trustee Ungerman? Yay. That carries 6 0. Thank you. Item B, we have recommendation of the Plan Commission of PC 2017-011, <coughs> preliminary plan for a special use for a plan unit development for an apartment development located on Reading Drive. That will turn it over to Director Young for a summary. Thank you, Mr. President. Tonight uh, we have the first of what will be two parts of a review for this proposed development. Uh, we're looking tonight at the Plan Commission recommendation for approval of a preliminary plan and special use for a plan unit development for an apartment development, which is proposed to be uh, located on 20.67 acres on either side of Reading Drive. The applicants are SR Jacobson and Sons and Edward Rose and Sons. Um, this site was first part of an annexation with the village in 1992, which included all of the Ogden Hill area and this 20 plus acres was a portion of that and zoned at that time R6 or multifamily. The site is bounded by R3 residential to the north and the northeast, M2 commercial to the east and the southeast, B2 open space and the library to the west, and then unincorporated property in the village of Oswego uh, to the south and south, south and southwest which is industrial and a commercial mix, and you have the auto dealer that's directly across the street on Route 30. <coughs> there are a total of 468 units proposed within this development, and those would be incorporated into 13 different buildings, including a mix of one, two, and three-bedroom units. 
Uh, the proposed development is in conformance with the comprehensive plan for the village of Montgomery. There are a few minor setback encroachments um, that would be included as part of the overall PUD approval, which is recommended by both the staff and the plan commission. The overall density of the proposed project is 22.64 units per acre for a total of, as I stated, 468 units. This is less than the 550 uh, proposed units that were part of the original annexation agreement, but it does exceed the standards outlined within our zoning ordinance, but as a part of the PUD, again, it's, it's less than the annexation agreement permitted um, many years ago. The um, plan complies with the number of parking spaces, the number of required garage spaces. More than 50% of all of the parking spaces would be incorporated in um, garage either attached or detached units. The uh, staff and the plan commission felt that, and it was their opinion, that the landscape plan meets the intent of the required landscape code with the uh, exception of some additional street trees that would be needed on the south side of Reading Drive. It's also the staff's and the plan commission's opinion that with regards to the architecture and materials, the developer has, uh, with the proposed buildings, met uh, and enhanced aesthetics for the overall proposed plan. Signage was just recently submitted. In fact, it was the night of the plan commission and is still under review, so a further recommendation will come regarding the signage and the monument signage that has been a part of your packet tonight. Um, again, this is the first of two parts of this review. First reading of the uh, resolution to approve the preliminary plan and the special use is tonight. You would have this back on your agenda again in two weeks, as well as a public hearing for the amendment to the annexation agreement, which would be required. That public hearing will take place two weeks from tonight at your next meeting. And I know that the applicants are here tonight. If you have any questions or would like to go through, uh, over the site plan in more detail, they're ready to do that now. Go ahead. I have a question, if I may. Um, I know in some of our existing apartment complexes, uh, there's Section 8 rentals available, and we seem to have issues there. Are there going to be Section 8 rentals available in this apartment complex? There's nothing specific to this development proposal that would include Section 8 vouchers. Now, some Section 8 vouchers people can take and can go anywhere. Um, we, that's something we can't control. Um, but there are <coughs> project-specific vouchers that would be requested for this project. If there are issues with tenants, how is that going to be uh, managed? If, if the police department is there numerous times, how is that going to be handled? Yeah, so, and it, that... That's a good question that sort of bleeds into a little bit, uh, it provided a lot of background to staff and to the plan commission about who it is that's actually developing this project. And, and uh, by the way, Russ Whitaker, I'm an attorney at Roosevelt and Whitaker in Naperville. Um, the, the cl my clients here are uh, S.R. Jacobson Development Corporation and Edward Rosenson. Um, this project is a unique partnership between two very <coughs> large players in the marketplace. Um, SR, SR Jacobson Development Company's family-owned business has been around for 40-plus years, uh, located in Michigan, but projects in both Michigan, Illinois, uh, and throughout the Midwest. Um, Edward, they're sort of dwarfed by Edward Rose, which is another family-owned business located out of Michigan. They've been around since 1921. They're actually the 12th largest multifamily owner in the United States and the 13th largest management company in the United States. What, is, what makes this partnership sort of unique and formidable, um, I think also hugely beneficial to the village, is that this isn't a uh, build it, flip it, monetize the project type deal. Um, this is a group or a, a part, or a, two parties that have come together with a, uh, uh, with a long-term strategy on, on not just this project, but other projects. Um, well, well, Edward Rose has built 85,000 units since 1921. Um, they own 65,000 of those units still today. I mean, it's a, it's a record I've never come across before. Um, so we're talking about people that are, have property under contract today are doing all of their own due diligence. Um, they've got their own plans, product that they build. Uh, they will go out, they've got a construction team that will go out and build it. Uh, they've got a team that will come in and manage it with somebody that will be living on site. 
Uh, there will be on-site people responsible for property management. Um, and it is their people that are actually managing it as well. So sort of soup to nuts, which is very, very uncommon um, in the development world that you've got sort of all of those trades applied into one project, but you do have that here. And this isn't something where these two entities are going away and you're not going to see them or ever hear from them again five years from now. They're building this project as a long-term investment and they expect to be here for the next couple of decades. Um, so I think that speaks in large part to your question. On top of that though, we certainly do have policies and procedures with respect to how a community is run. Um, I didn't, I didn't <coughs> review those specifically for tonight's meeting. We could probably get into more detail on them. Um, but I know that there are, there are policies and procedures that are in place with respect to those issues, whether it be background checks or things like that, in order to make sure that the, this would not be a problem. My next question is I know that um, as a village board, we push the crime-free housing addendum or attachment to leases. Is that something that we could give this management company and have them provide to their the the renters and they have to sign that and we can certainly you okay. know, give it to them and absolutely I'm just trying to make your job easier chief no oh, I, I greatly appreciate that I have a, <clears throat> I, I'm not go ahead I have a question related to and I <clears throat> pardon me and I had asked this after the last meeting um, that give you a heads up I was going to be asking about the impact to the school district uh, number of students projected. I understand that it's just a projection, but there's some matrix for that. What are we projecting out of 468 units? Thank you. You went. Seven whole kids. <laughs> it's uh, so. I, I mean, on an apartment project, there's 57, not, there's 57 children, uh, 57 school-age children, um, to be exact. I mean, the question is impact in the school district. So if we look at kids K through <laughs> high school. Um, it would be projected to be 57 kids. And that's per your ordinance, which is the ICSC standards, um, pretty well adopted uh, everywhere in suburban Chicago. Um, there would be a total of 825 um, adults. So you, in a project like this, you're going to see a much larger uh, proportion of the population being adults than you would in a, in a, a single family home or a, a townhome community. Um, there, I, we've got 13 pre-K students, um, but those, those as we've looked at other communities, those numbers seem to be uh, a fair representation. And they tend to be pretty accurate, too. Thank you. Which fire protection district is this? Is this Montgomery? Is it? Is it? Okay. That kind of segues into one of my comments. I would like to underscore my interest in the no crime agreement or crime reduction agreement. Um, I had raised the issue with Director Young about um, emergency vehicle ability to move and navigate in the design that we're currently looking at. He indicated that the fire department has had a look-see, but that's of concern. There's several of the areas appear to me to be pretty tight quarters. Their original plan, um, <clears throat> was reviewed by the fire district and they have a, a design uh, graphic that goes through the entire property to make sure that the turning radiuses for their largest equipment can maneuver. So there were some adjustments made uh, to the plan that you see tonight uh, to incorporate those uh, turning movements. I, I felt like I could identify a few areas where if there were emergency vehicles there, there probably wouldn't be room for other vehicles to get in and out to the extent that might be important and I the same uh, similar concern about snow removal I'm not sure in a heavy snowfall where the snow would be staged or if it were staged somewhere on the property how, how that would impact parking or emergency vehicle access yeah and I mean those those things happen like that. so we do as part of our engineering process we have uh, the turning templates that we that we would use um, our engineering firm on this project is Kenny Horn and Associates um, as part of the engineering submittal, we would do, we would coordinate with the fire protection district, understand what trucks it is that they would be utilizing at the site. We would then run them through the auto turn analysis to understand if they could in fact make it around all the turns. Now, would, could, if they are in certain areas, could you necessarily 
cycle cars around those trucks? I'm possibly not, but I don't. In, in most instances, if the fire trucks park there, I don't think you necessarily <coughs> have cars driving by them. But there is there is certainly the ability to get in and out of the development, um, no matter where a fire truck were staged. So there's there's not a not a sort of bottleneck that we would be creating here. Um, and the other question, I'm sorry. Snow loading. Snow loading. Yes, and we, we did look at that. And if you if you when you when you look at the the plan in whole, it's actually a, a 20 acre property um, with 800 and some odd parking spots. So it begins to be it, you begin to lose scale um, it, when you're looking at that big of a property on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. But as you zoom in, you actually do begin to identify that there are a number of oversized islands, particularly in the south end. Um, where you typically would have uh, maybe an eight foot round island, there are actually long islands that stretch 20 spaces and maybe 10 feet wide, they're full of landscape, uh, and there are areas where the, the snow would be able to be fished. So that is analysis that we've run. We don't believe that there would be, um, that the snow would necessarily be able to be, need to be stored in parking spaces. However, we do have an excess of parking. Um, we, as, as Rich had mentioned, um, we have indoor parking in the sense that it's actually built into the, the residential buildings. Um, so you don't have to leave the building in order to get to your car. We have detached garages and then we have surface spaces. So a lot of different options for residents. But I think we were circa 40 or 60 spaces over the code requirement, um, which gives us enough flexibility uh, to be able to push and pull on all of that stuff. So we were, from a management standpoint, those are things that we look at. Um, and we're comfortable with being able to handle snow. They get a lot more snow in Michigan where they're from than we do. <laughs> Two more comments. And um, a comment related to the dog park and just a suggestion that it be explored as to whether it's wise to have a, a dog park that close to the swimming pool area because of the potential to transmit disease. That's one I will, I, I will plead total ignorance to. Um, <laughs> I mean, we've got a, a landscape architect on the project, um, and, and at this point in the game, a lot, of, some of the areas like the pool are sort of roughed out, and the details of that deck will be uh, will be forthcoming as we come back for final approvals. So that's absolutely something we can look at as we move Please do. I'm, I like the idea of a dog park. I'm just not convinced that next to the pool is a good spot <laughs> for it. And my final comment is related to density. While I really like the look and feel of the architectural design, I would be much happier representing our public if the density were closer, somewhere in between where you want to be and where our current standard is. So it's a very dense construction that you're, you're proposing to us. So yes, but no. And it's, it's interesting because it's, it, the density is really driven by how the application before you was positioned. Um, we've talked about this being a 20 acre parcel. We actually have 30 acres. Um, so we have the 20 acres that you see that are the proper area that's being developed. We also have a nine, I think it's nine and a quarter acre parcel that is immediately adjacent and then wraps around the library. If you were to look at that total 30 acres that we'll be buying, your density is gonna drop down almost right to the code requirement. Um, so if you look at all of the acreage that we're actually buying as a part of this project, I think the density falls right in line with your code requirement. It's really a, a technical issue of how the petition was drafted. <coughs> and the reason we did that is because that additional 9.23 acre parcel is zone B2. If we would have included that in our petition, we would have had to include a, a, a rezoning request. And, and frankly, our intent, and this is something we've been working on the village, working with uh, village staff on, is that that becomes a pu publicly dedicated open space. So it does fulfill that intent where it's open space, which has the product of reducing the density. But our, pers our, our perspective is that should be more publicly owned than privately owned. And the village can then, if there's the desire to do uh, launches down um, at the creek or whatever, whatever the desire is on that area, and I know in the prior annexation agreement there was some desire for public access down to the creek. Mm -hmm. We'll go ahead, we'll give you that whole nine acre parcel and whatever you guys do with it, uh, so be it so long as you're not building convenient parking spaces. I think that's, that's a fair request, right? <coughs> okay.
Another question. Um, Onyx Drive and um, Reading Drive or Reading Drive, are they to be village owned or are they private? Reading is already, isn't it? Reading is. Reading? Reading is. Oh, is it? Yeah. See, I. That's a, never mind. That would be by the library. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know where the library was yeah. two weeks ago. So. Runs right in there. But Onyx Drive, every, we're, we're not proposing any new public right of way. Um, so no increase to any of your maintenance costs on that, uh, on that side of it. Um, Onyx Drive would be private improvement owned and maintained by us. Um, okay. the, frankly, the only roadway or access type improvement that is required as part of this overall deal um, is we're improving Goodwin, Goodwin uh, to include a left turn lane um, into the project. And we've studied that through a traffic study and found that that was necessary. Um, and that's something that we'll be taking. Related question, is there to be any parking on either Reading Drive or Onyx Drive? Okay. Maybe we to current? further clarify, the two stub streets that you see coming off of Reading Drive, the two stub streets, <coughs> uh, Steve, would go to the um, Marquee Point development, so there would be access. Um, but they technically would be private and then go to the public roads in uh, Marquee Point. Awesome. And we currently plow re uh, Reading Drive? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Russ while he's here? All I could say is that I looked up your company up on the internet and um, used the same figures, that, or I found the same figures you quoted with the 80,000, 85,000, and keeping, still owning 60,000. I thought maybe this Jacob was an out, somebody else. But once you said it was family owned, I understand that. Uh, we seem to always be short parking spots and people are parking on roadways, like Goodwin say, because there's not enough parking. You seem to have enough parking, but Maybe like you say, some of those other areas that you have open now, you may have to put into parking if the parking gets too many. Uh, as far as 57 people with these units, whoever did that I think was way off. Uh, I can see the three units, or the 26 three bedroom units, they're gonna have kids, probably. But I can't see two, out of 250 uh, units, you're gonna have a lot of single moms and kids. I don't think you're gonna have two guys moving in. No, you might, uh, just a party or something. Uh, but I, I, I see a lot of families in that 250. Now maybe, at least that's the way it is around this area. Uh, and when you said around the area, you're looking, maybe you're looking at Naperville, but I think you gotta look more like toward Labonte High School and some of them, those apartments uh, sometimes it's it's uh, a two bedroom unit. You may have five people, and and some of them are kids. And I think that's where you're going to be a little light on the school system. Yeah, and as part of the policy guidelines that we would have for the development, there would actually be limitations on how many people could be in each unit. So based on the size and the number of bedrooms, there could be limitations. So I I couldn't I I don't recall off the top of my head exactly what that was, but. Uh, we would not allow a certain number of people in a two-bedroom. Because we would, we would love to have that policy, but not being a home rule town, we can't do that. Aurora can do that. We'd love to do it on spacing, but. There's actually a HUD guideline yes, for the number of the people number, that can be in a It just seems still that you're gonna have more than 50 kids. I don't, I, I don't know. That's I guess gonna be the school's problem. Is there going to be overnight parking or on-street parking allowed on Reading or Goodwin Drive? No. No, neither one? Okay. Be. There'll be no parking signs posted? Okay. Russ mentioned earlier that they actually exceed the number of planned parking spaces from what our code shows. So there's, again, there is some extra open space that could be looked at as parking, but they already exceed, I believe, by 40 spaces, I believe, uh, the number of required spaces in our own code. So 
I think that's a positive for the visitors or what have you uh, to keep people from, you know, parking on the street. Yeah, but I'm worried that if someone parks on Reading Drive to walk up to my front door, they're not parking in the appropriate spot in the parking spot in back. Well, then it becomes a matter of patrol, frankly. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Whitaker or the petitioner? As I mentioned, this is the first reading tonight. Um, you would have the resolution before you again in two weeks. If you have any questions in the interim, please let me know so we can try to work those uh, questions into our discussion next time, as well as you will have the first portion of the annexation agreement amendment, I believe. We will definitely have the public hearing. We hope to have a draft document that staff can recommend uh, positively on from the developer at that time. Awesome. Like motion to approve the recommendation of the Planning Commission. Second. PC 2007-011. A motion and a second. Any, any other uh, discussion? Call the roll, please. Trustee Marisek? Yes. Trustee Bond? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Hines? Yay. Trustee Youngerman? Yay. That carries 6 0. Thank you. And then the second item is resolution 2017 012, approval of the preliminary plan of a special use. And that, this is first reading, it doesn't say that, but this is first reading of that. We'll act on it at the next meeting. Okay. And we'll also have the public hearing at the next meeting as well. Okay. And the public hearing is on the amendment to the? <coughs> public hearing would be on the amendment to the annexation agreement. There's been several amendments to the annexation yeah. agreement since 1999. This would be the next one, but specifically dealing with just this acreage. I got you. And the information about that modification to the annexation agreement is publicly available before that public hearing, or? Uh, yes, it would have to be made available to the public. Okay. All right. Perfect. We'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, Russ. All right, we'll move on to uh, item D. We have uh, 2018 motor fuel tax resolution, which is 2017-011, uh, approving uh, salt and calcium chloride purchase. And I will turn it over to Director Hoppenstead for this one. Thank you, Mr. President. As you know, the authorization and use of motor fuel tax MFT funds require a resolution to be passed by the village board and approved by the Illinois Department of Transportation. Uh, the village is also required to submit an approval, uh, submit for approval by IDOT a municipal estimate of maintenance costs. The proposed cost for the upcoming fiscal year uh, total $72,242. We're recommending the use of MFT funds for the following. Um, with regards to snow removal, the purchase of rock salt at uh, $47.91 a ton for 12 100 tons, equaling $57,492. Uh, 2,500 gallons of calcium chloride at a dollar per gallon, equaling $2,500. Weather forecasting service uh, used through the prediction of weather events throughout the winter months um, at $350 a month for five months, equaling $1,750. <coughs> and finally, maintenance of the uh, permanent salt storage facility minor roof repairs in a lump sum cost of $10,500. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to entertain those. Just a quick question. How much salt do we have in stock still from last year? It's, it's somewhat hard to quantify, um, but I would guess in the neighborhood of 2,700 tons. Was Oswego storing some of that for we us? We have 800 tons of Oswego salt on our property, okay. yes, but that is theirs. We're only going to give them 400 back. Motion to approve. Second. Mm -hmm. All roll, please. Trustee Bond. Yes. Trustee Sperling. Yes. Trustee Lee. Yes. Trustee Hines. Yay. Trustee Youngerman. Yay. Trustee Marsick. Yes. That carries 6 0. Thank you. Item E, we have recommendation of the Montgomery Development Fund Committee, and then I guess we'll take that one. 
Who wants this? Well, staff is requesting that we table both items E and F for tonight. Uh, based on new information we have received, uh, the committee needs time to discuss the item again, then we'll bring it back to you in the future. Anybody opposed to that? Perfect. All right, moving on, items for discussion. Uh, 2017 tax levy. Thank you, President Brawley. State statute requires the village announce its estimated and proposed 2017 property tax levy at least 20 days prior to the passage, uh, which is scheduled for December 11th, 2017, advance, in advance of the filing deadline of December 26th. Staff recommends the village board announce an estimated and proposed levy of $2,284,335. Um, that includes uh, new construction and then it also includes uh, the cap under the property tax extension limitation law of 2.1% for a total of $119,361 higher than last year. Um, something that uh, I included this year just <coughs> for the board to uh, see the relation between uh, the three graphs. Um, the rate setting equalized EAV or the EAV that uh, you see on your tax bill <coughs> is going to be the top graph and then the middle graph is the tax rate. You can see that those are moving opposite of each other. So if the EAV is going up, the rate's going, the rate's going down. So, <coughs> um, and then on the bottom, essentially you take the EAV uh, times the tax rate, and that's where you come up with a tax levy. What you're seeing in the, in the later years there, um, 2010 and after is a very slight increase each year. That is going to be the new uh, construction growth um, that the village has had over those years. Um, the one other item I wanted to, actually, I'll just say, if there's any questions, I'll answer those at this time. I'm sure there's questions. You want me to start? Sure. I'm going to say the same thing I said last year. I cannot vote for a property tax increase. Um, I'm not, even the allowable EAV increase I'm not going to support it until we are squeezing nickels so hard that they bleed pennies. I'm not going to vote for an EAV increase. So I appreciate you. You're doing your job bringing it to us, but I will not vote for a tax increase. Yeah, I think for the past three years in a row, we've pulled out the PTEL four years. So I think it's nearly unanimous to leave that in, or at least there's, I mean, to pull that out um, of the request, so. But we truly appreciate that you're asking. Yeah, it doesn't hurt to ask. So with that taken out, um, the PTEL no, he needs to ask. would so he allow for $47,000 uh, of additional <coughs> taxes. The new property we're looking at uh, would raise approximately $72,000. Um, so that's the split between the two. Um, if we take the PTEL out, the 119 will then go down to that 72. Could and that is just a new construction and, and bringing um, not fully assessed properties up to full assessment? Could you repeat the first number again, Justin, the, the impact of not increasing our levy? The impact of not increasing the levy by uh, PTEL is $47,000. Okay. <laughs> I like the fact that you were prepared and actually had the number pulled out for us. Thank you. Oh, and, and I was going to tell you this after, but I really do appreciate you actually uh, bringing that to us so that we can make yeah. that decision, which you knew we were going to say anyway. <clears throat> um, but the reality is we're trying to keep 
the part of our property tax bill that comes from Montgomery, um, constant if not falling slowly uh, year over year, just to do what we can to help maybe setting that example for uh, other agencies to do the same, which some have. King County, I know, has done that. So with that, we will have the um, public hearing on this in December. The public hearing will be at the second meeting in November. All right, we'll have it in November then. Let's and then we'll sorry. pass the ordinance. That's what on it is. December 11th. See, there you go. Awesome. Thank you. Is this our last meeting for November, though? No. no we meet we on have the one 27th. more. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It'll be the Monday after Thanksgiving. Okay. Wow. All right. <laughs> All right, with that, we'll move on to uh, item B, which is the drainage issues that we've been talking about. Uh, Engineer Wallers. So this evening I'd like to review two items, uh, follow up from the October 23rd meeting. The first is uh, regarding Aurora University. Um, at the last, at the October 23rd meeting, we talked about um, that we believed Aurora had done uh, and fulfilled all the obligations under the King County Stormwater Ordinance and our floodplain ordinance. And I just wanted to um, recap that so that you uh, had that information. So at this point, um, from a detention standpoint, the, um, the amount of impervious that they added to the project required nine and a half acre feet of storage. Their plans provided 10 acre feet. And the one element that we're still waiting on is the certified volumes. Uh, that's what the as-built is. So that's still pending. but. The point is, as it was designed, it met the criteria. The second item was relative to floodplain comp storage, and um, the floodplain fill was approximately 3,857 cubic yards, and we compensate that at a ratio of one and a half to one, so it's not just a one for one uh, requirement. So they were required to provide uh, 5,786 cubic yards of storage and they actually proposed uh, 6,264. So again, they met the requirement from the design side. Uh, we're still waiting on their as-built um, calculator, their as-built survey to determine that. Um, just again, to recap, that was the, um, the floodplain um, map that we used to determine the amount of fill, and that is not uh, require, is not recorded as regulatory yet. That's the best available data that we have for the site. The regulatory map has a smaller amount of floodplain on it. So we tried to use the more conservative um, mapping for the calculation of the requirement for the comp storage. So as soon as we get the as-built, we'll certainly report that to the village board so you'll know um, that okay. that's been accomplished uh, per plan. And I don't want to cut you off, but we had people's, um, you know, houses were flooded on October 13th. We talked about it on October 22nd. Everybody indicated that their, um, their support for investigating this and looking at it. How does it take that long? I know that the university is using the facility, has got occupancy to use parts of it, but yet we still don't, they still have not turned over a simple survey of the land. Because all the while people are cleaning up their basements and, and trying to get back to life, and we can't do a survey and send it into the village. Well, I talked to the university again today. I've been after them to get hopefully something before tonight's meeting on the as built so that EEI would have a chance to take a look at it. Um, they have changed engineers in the process of going through this first phase of development, so they got caught up in between two engineering firms, frankly, and not to make excuses for the university, but. It was a situation where they're asking for follow-up of the previous engineer, which who's perfectly willing to do it, but what I was told today was that as of late last week, they were still waiting to get some additional information from the surveyor so that they could complete the work on the as belts and get it to the university. So that's where it stands as of today, and in fact, um, they came in personally and, and told me this about 4 o'clock this afternoon. So. I appreciate it. And I don't mean to put either of you in, in, a, in the hot seat, and it's certainly not your issue, and I appreciate you being the advocate for the residents that are here. It's, as you're probably all aware, it's pretty commonplace for us to look at doing 
temporary COs, and maybe, frankly, we have to evaluate that again. Um, there was an extreme push by the university to get a temporary CO to have the fields activated so that they could be used for some competition late this fall. Mm -hmm. Now, they told me today there won't be any other, I don't believe there's any other events there this year. But um, again, we're, we're looking for the final um, as built just as much as the university is, and we hope to have them next week. Yeah, and, and I don't mean to imply that the university had done anything wrong in this, that they, you know, the Esbilts might come back, that they did everything they were supposed to do, uh, but we don't know that. And um, so it'd just be nice to see that turnaround a little bit quicker, but everybody in the room, I think, understands that. So, okay. And I would say that just the last element on that um, project, we understand there will be a phase two, and we're certainly going to look at uh, opportunities to improve anything we can relative to the Linden and Joshua drainage. Um, the county's well aware of it, um, and certainly we'll be working with them to try to see if there's something in the phase two, which actually gets closer to uh, those residences that we might be able to help them. Thank you. Okay, so the second item I wanted to cover is the Lakewood Creek drainage investigation. and. Um, I included in the board packet the uh, report that was done in 2013 for your reference. And then this is the presentation that we did October 22nd of 2013, and then we've updated it to address some of the items uh, from the November storm, uh, or excuse me, the, the, uh, the recent October uh, storm that we just had. So I want to go through that. Um, and what I did is I highlighted in blue uh, the items that have sort of changed or that are different from the uh, 2013 report. Um, the, re the recorded rainfall did vary throughout the um, region, um, but we believe it was about seven and a half inches of rain in a 48 hour period. Now I do know that I've talked to some folks individually that recorded more rainfall than that at their homes, but this is based on the best uh, data we have from the U.S. Weather Service. So, um, but that, to put it in perspective, um, an 8.2 inch storm in 48 hours is about a 100 year event. So it, it, as I think one of the residents said, it was a significant rainfall. In some respects, I'm not sure it's that important other than understand that it was a, of a significant nature. Um, after the 2013 storm, what we have, uh, observed was a very long drawdown from those areas that uh, had standing water in the Commonwealth Edison uh, easement. Um, the improvements that were made after 2013 did help. We know that from observation. So while the drawdowns I don't think were as quick as anyone would uh, you know, think is correct, they were better than what we saw in 13. So there was some improvement at least. This uh, drawing is again uh, to give you some perspective on um, the lay of the of the land up there. So the um, the area that we had flooding along was at Lakewood Creek West, and the area in the Commonwealth Edison easement, and obviously against the the homes that were backing up to it. That area drains into a detention basin uh, just south of Troon. And then it cascades its way down through other detention basins down to Blackberry Creek. So the, the improvement that was done in uh, 2013 was to remove the restrictors that were in these basins so that we had better flow through. We still maintain the amount of detention required by ordinance, but what it allowed us to do was bypass some of the, the flows that um, come from the north. And uh, that would be the stuff at the Stewart Sports Complex and the Commonwealth Edison uh, easement to the north of 30. So it allowed us to bypass those flows through a little more effectively, but still not enough um, capacity to move it through as quickly as we'd like. These are, I probably um, won't dwell on some of the items that we covered in 13 since it, unless you, you know, want to go back and talk about it. But just a couple of points here. Um, the um, again, I just covered the restrictor design, but um, the trip, the 24-inch culvert uh, is really one of the contributing elements to the flooding problem. 
um, on the Commonwealth Edison easement to the south of 30. And uh, again, we addressed the bypass flow with the restrictors. The thing I want to mention at this point, I'm going to cover it again later, but the Illinois Department of Transportation is completing the phase one study for Route 30 that includes uh, analysis of the drainage along the corridor. They're, they're going from Illinois uh, Route 31 all the way to 47. And when we had the <coughs> meetings with them, we identified this area as a problem spot and we wanted to see if we could work in conjunction with IDOT to mitigate this problem. We've not received their final drainage uh, plan. Uh, it hasn't been approved by the department yet and uh, we'd like to see that uh, because we think that might help um, at least help us plan better for this area. So that's just a pending item that, again, I'll come back to in a little bit. We have put together um, a computer model so that we can simulate the flows, and it's really um, wasn't intended to be a calibrated model, but it was intended to help us do analysis to screen alternatives, and that's what we've used it for. We can go to, we can go to the next step of calibrating that model. We can talk about that at the end to see if it's um, worthy of that um, investigation. Um, but again, we, um, we're really looking to upsize the restrictors and bypass the flows, and that's what uh, the recommendations were back in 2013. We developed both short and long-term um, recommendations. So if we can move on then. So one thing that's been completed is the upsize of the restrictors, so that has been done. Um, throughout all of those basins. Uh, that was done by public works staff, so really we didn't have a <coughs> significant cost expenditure there. Um, we talked about it in 2013 what could be potential funding mechanisms, uh, whether it was general, uh, CIP, uh, special assessment, or special service area. That was probably one of the bigger limitations in 2013. Obviously, since then, we have, have the uh, infrastructure uh, funding mechanism that wasn't in place then, so that's something we can talk about a little bit later. Um, on the long-term side, we looked at a uh, extending a 24-inch storm sewer from basically the culvert on 30 all the way through and down to the detention basin just north of Troon. Um, at the time, it was a estimated about 113,000. We've updated the cost. These are still preliminary numbers when we if we move forward to construction, obviously we'll update these costs as we refine it, but order of magnitude about 143,000. I suspect it'll come in less than that, but it's, that's the number that we have at this time. And then we had a second outfall that we'd like to look at, um, and that was to connect to the storm sewer uh, to Lakewood Creek, uh, and that was about uh, 20,000 in uh, 13. We think it's about 25,000 today. The funding options, again, were what we had discussed in 13. And then this was the um, kind of the summary improvements for the uh, proposed improvements. Uh, we called this alternate five. And it's, I know it's a little hard to see, but this is uh, the connection of a pipe to the 24 inch storm sewer that comes across 30, carries that water down then and directly into the detention basin. And then this is that secondary outfall we talked about, which connects to a storm sewer that drains to Lakewood Creek uh, subdivision. All of the water ends up in the same place, it's Black Ridge Creek, so we're not diverting water from any, any watershed or anything like that. It's just trying to get it to the more efficient storm sewer system so that we can get it out of the Commonwealth Edison easement faster. Can we ask questions? Yeah, anytime. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? <clears throat> what happens if it, it all ends up in the Blackberry Creek, right? Yeah. If Blackberry Creek is so high and it will it ever not allow more water in? So that's the reason that we went to what we would call a kind of a unified uh, stormwater model where we can uh, simulate the, the elevations of all the ponds during the 100 year storm and the elevation of the creek so we can see what kind of restrictions we have. So we know we don't have free discharge, we'll have submerged outlets. So we think that the model has done a pretty good job of telling us you know, how much water we're gonna be able to get out of there. And based on what we've observed after the 17 storm, um, you know, we think it's reasonably accurate. It's probably a little conservative at this point, but um, I think it does take all those elements into effect. Thank you. 
Did I read that with the option five that was going to reroute to Lakewood Creek's basin, that it's about two feet high? The inlet is about two feet above water level? I thought I read that in the packet. Yeah, I think you might have been referring to inlets along rear yards on, um, on the west side of the um, Commonwealth Edison easement. I'd have to look at the report to find out the exact reference. Okay, because that would be, because that Lakewood Creek Basin is pretty large. Yes. So two feet over that size basin is a lot of gallons of water. Yeah, I don't think that this would be measurable impact to that basin. Um, yeah. That's, if, if the, also the thing that we put at the conclusion of that basin is basically when we finally, you know, if we would have had funding, let's say in 13, we would have done some additional modeling to ensure that we didn't have any issues relative to overload of that storm sewer. We haven't gone to that next step yet, but I think if we move forward to a solution and want to implement it, we're going to want to do a, some additional modeling just to ensure that we haven't missed something you know, obvious, but um, we don't think it's going to be an issue. So here I, I just wanted to, there were seven alter, or excuse me, six alternatives <coughs> that were reviewed back in 13. We basically dismissed, number one was basically to put the restrictors in. So that's been accomplished, that's in green. The ones that are um, highlighted in red were not held for further study. So the one in blue is alternate five. That's what was uh, held over for additional study. That was the addition of the 24 inch storm sewer and then the 15 inch uh, relief stor storm sewer from Troon. And then getting ready for this meeting, we added an, another alternative number seven. Um, we wanted to see what would happen if we um, put in a smaller diameter pipe uh, in the Commonwealth Edison easement. And so alternate seven is that reflects that, um, um, that smaller pipe, which would be a 15 inch pipe. And if you go one more, Jeff, um, there's a um, exhibit that shows both those alternatives. Okay, so on this one exhibit, th you can see this is the original 24 inch. This would be alternate five. But what we did is we installed a 15 inch pipe here to see how effective that might be to drain the um, Commonwealth Edison easement and try to reduce costs a little bit. We haven't quite finalized all the modeling on that, but we thought it would be appropriate to you know, look at additional alternatives just to see if there's a way to reduce cost. And mainly with the thought that if IDOT um, manages some of the water on Route 30, they're proposing to do a storm sewer down to uh, Blackberry Creek as well, that we wouldn't need the 24 inch, necessarily need the 24 inch. Can't say that for sure yet. The other thing we're gonna explore is whether or not we would participate with IDOT to oversize their pipe. The biggest problem with the IDOT solution is timing. Um, we may not be able to wait that long. And I think that's probably the, the reality, but I think it's prudent to at least look at it. We can always, um, we don't have to um, implement based on their solutions, but we should know it at least and, and make sure that this thing works um, as effectively as it can. So um, next steps or additional considerations, we'd like to determine the impact of the IDOT US 30 phase one proposed improvements just so we know exactly what they're proposing and how it impacts uh, this area. Um, either alternative five or seven, or if we added a number eight, for example, will require some uh, easements from ComEd. Um, one thing that we also wanna look at is instead of taking the storm sewer directly into the Troon Basin. Another alternative would be to route it directly into the uh, storm sewer that goes into the Lakewood Creek Subdivision Basin, the large basin. We, again, we just didn't have time to look at that in detail, <coughs> but I'd like to do that before we would recommend any final uh, solution. This evening though, really what we're interested in is knowing what the board wants us to do and when, and we would certainly come back at a future meeting with answers to the questions that are posed and um, move forward with whatever direction you want to give us. I, th I have a couple questions. Can we go back to the slide where it says alternates five and seven exhibit, please? 
regardless of either alternate five or seven, there is an existing, I think, 12-inch pipe that runs behind those homes with an inlet every other home. Is it's actually larger than that, but it's a little bit higher. It's a, it varies in size from... Um, Well, my, my question is, in either of these alternates, either five or seven, the existing is still used, and this is in addition to what is there, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, how will, is ComEd going to be accommodating as far as solving, or help solving this issue as far as letting us do what work we need to do? Well, we haven't requested an easement from them yet, so we really don't know for certain. But I would say that generally our experience has been this will be an underground improvement, so it shouldn't affect the, their ability to access the site or do anything in the future. And so we've been able to successfully get easements to put in bike paths. Um, I don't, again, I don't anticipate that there would be a problem, but I can tell you it's not the most expedient process in our experience. So. That's something that we would work on over the course of the winter to try to get uh, an easement so that when uh, we're, you know, if we're going to move forward with construction next construction season, that we'd have that easement. Um, and we would certainly, de again, depending on the discussion this evening, we'd reach out to ComEd and start to open that dialogue. Uh, there's a new person that uh, represents the, the group now. Uh, you know, Sylvia is retired, so we'll get that person on board, go through it, and I. You know, I'm optimistic that that's not going to be an impediment to the project. In the, um, you mentioned um, the state and Illinois Route 30, and that we may not at some point have to do that if we were doing a 24 inch. But as we were talking earlier, isn't it better to do, to have that extra capacity in case it's ever needed? What, what I'd like to be able to do is take the state's information and put it into the model so we could kind of make that determination. You may be absolutely correct. We know that um, you know climate change is upon us. We're seeing uh, more frequent, higher intensity storms. So having additional capacity is certainly not a bad thing. And we'd want to look at that. I have a concern with we're putting more into this, the Troon Basin. And my fear is we move that water, and it was, as Brent showed us, a lake. Lake Brent, I referred to it now. Um, we move that water into that Troon Basin. Are we now just going to, so these seven homes are no longer flooded, but these ten homes are now going to be flooded, whereas the Lakewood Creek Basin, I, if, I, I have a feeling, and I'm not an engineer. I play one on TV. Um, if that were to get high... It is literally hundreds of yards away from the creek. So if it were to spill over, it would spill directly into the creek. It wouldn't it, if if it got too high. So obviously, that's a big concern for us: is the the how everything works together, and we, we do not want to transfer prop one problem to another location. Certainly. Um, based on what we've done so far with the computer modeling we have, we don't believe that's the case. And, um, but again, uh, Trustee Marzak, we want to look at this a little bit closer before we finalize our solution. And we had given our model to um, the state to add their improvements to, and I'd like to get that back and then look at this again. Um, we're probably going to do a little bit more um, little bit more work to see how the water gets over to the Lakewood Creek Basin uh, because I agree with you that has some pretty good potential uh, but we don't want to by the same token overload those storm sewers and have any kind of problems in Lakewood Creek that we don't have today either so no matter where we we, we have the right to bypass flows that's clear you know? so we're not doing anything improper um, the question is how to best do it and move the water through. And then ultimately, as things develop, we'll probably see some additional storage on the north side of the watershed that'll help this as well. But that may be some, again, maybe sometime in the future. 
That was one of the questions that I had too. I, it may have been one of the alternates that you looked at. And I don't know how much flow is coming through this area, but it's obviously a large amount of that is coming from the north side of the road. Um, you can see from like the depressional areas north. If you were to add, if we were to work with the park district and expand their basins there, does that provide any benefit? I think so, and that, that's one of the th other things that we wanted to do is just to see if there's a way that we could um, maybe um, refine their release rate a little bit to provide a little more, uh, you know, detention on that. <coughs> and I think that's a possibility. I don't think it'll impact their facility at all, so we would certainly look at that. During that storm, was the detention basin at Stewart, was it full at total capacity? I believe it was. Okay. But there's no way for the village to restrict the amount of water flowing under 30, that's all state? Right. It's 24-inch culvert under Route 30 is state control. Because I know when I drove through there, I drove the bike path the day after the flooding, and the Troon Basin was it looked like it was going to over about to overflow at any moment and the, but i continued west because i didn't realize that it that continued south and i continued west across the street down the the sidewalk to the next detention basin and it was significantly lower and that's the troon basin the one that well, what's this one right here that's the troon basin that's do, the one do that's they have west two, of troon. two basins no, the ComEd one is not a basin. It just looked like one that No, day. There's, there's even a detention basin further west of this as you go down the bike path across the street. There's another one. That's probably, that's not connected to this system. So okay. It's a separate discharge into um, Blackbird. Okay. Engineer Wallers, in your map, Blackberry Creek kind of disappears toward this southwest corner, what other authority has responsibility for Blackberry once it leaves, I, I, I presume at some point it leaves our boundaries? Well, each community and county that um, the creek would flow through would be responsible for uh, floodplain management, uh, <coughs> as, just as we are. Um, and in Kane County, um, anybody that develops along Blackberry Creek would follow the Kane County ordinance, which you know, obviously we do. Um, and then in Kendall, Kendall has a countywide ordinance that they follow, and that would either be done whether it's in uh, Kendall County Unincorporated or Yorkville uh, city limits. So all of the jurisdictions along the entire Blackberry Creek have uh, some um, stormwater management ordinance that guide the development, and they also all follow the current FEMA regulations. Is, do you see any merit to giving voice to this problem that we're having to the folks downstream? I don't think anything that we're doing is altering the flow uh, in a measurable amount. All we're doing is really a little more throughput, throughput um, through the system, but I don't think it's going to be measurable uh, when you yeah. put it relative to the flow through Blackberry Creek at flood stage. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm going at the opposite concern is, do you envision anything that may be happening south of us that's restricting the flow? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. The, you know, Blackberry Creek um, is a significant watershed, so we're at the, um, and it, it's something that we've uh, had to contend with throughout uh, all of our development on the west side. The, the creek has approximately 65 to 70 square miles of drainage that is above us. So the flow through Blackberry Creek is significant. And you know we've had issues with the Montgomery overflow and the flooding you know, along uh, Jericho and um, Auket and that area, and that's all a result of you know, the flows in the Blackberry. And recall that when we did our initial developments on the west side, so Lakewood Creek being the first one, we were the first community to adopt the 0.1 CFF per acre release rate. And we also went with a higher flood protection elevation along Blackberry Creek um, to try to anticipate some changes over time. Um, so we're, you know, we've, we've done, I think, um, 
what we could do to mitigate flooding and impacts of drainage. Uh, this area, um, you know, just has more offsite drainage than, than was represented at the time it was developed and, and um, uh, designed. But uh, I do think we have some, some ways to overcome that now. One question that I had is, did you find any evidence of um, overland flooding, or is this all subsurface? To the best of our knowledge, and I, I can't say that this is absolutely correct, but there are two homes that we're aware of that have what normally would be characterized as English basements where they have, uh, win they're not full walkout basements, but they're, um, they have windows that you can see into the basement. I believe that those two structures would be at risk for overland flooding. I think those are the ones that got sandbagged, and I, you know, Todd can probably represent that. I think the rest of the um, drainage issues that we're aware of anyway were because of the sump pumps not being able to keep up with the uh, infiltration. Okay. That's correct. All right. Any other questions for if staff? When we look at these options, um, I know there's a bike path that runs behind Brian. There, there are existing inlets that are right on the property line, every other house. If you add another line there, will it be on the other side of the bike path? or will it be right adjacent to where the line is now? It'll be on the east side of the bike path. Um, if we put the 24 inch in, we'd put it to the far east side of the um, Commonwealth Edison easement. If we put the 15 inch in, we pick up a low area and we want it to be on the west side of the, of the Commonwealth Edison right away. But in all cases, it would be east of the bike path trail. So we'd be leaving the storm sewers that are in people's backyards right now and avoid having to tear up all of their backyards and putting it all in the comet right away. That would be the plan. Yeah, but it hasn't been designed yet, so we don't know for sure. So it sounds like we need to, go ahead. You had a question? No, I was gonna summarize, but. Oh, I guess, so there's two of the houses that <clears throat> had overland flooding have the lookout English basements. That could have. That w could have or or did have. Is it customary to have that construction in a low-lying area? Did the builder not do right by these people by putting? You know, Doug, I think it's. I don't think anybody was aware of the problem honestly when those <coughs> homes were designed and put on those lots. Um, honestly, we didn't believe there was a problem there know of any issues and it was, wasn't until the 2013 storm that we realized that we had an issue. So I don't think, it's probably not, it's just sometimes things happen. And wasn't foreseeable. It, I don't think it was foreseeable. Okay. And how long before, and this, we're really trailing on with this, but how long before 2013 were these homes built? Stumped everybody. So 2004 is what you're saying, the, and that's the west side of the easement. It's interesting that no <clears throat> storm event in nine years well, that we know of, or that. I mean, honestly, we take we uh, monitor storms pretty closely here, and I can tell you that that 2013 storm was one of the larger storms that we had. I'd have to go back in our records now, but I, I just think that, that we didn't have any major storms. Yeah. You know, we had the, obviously in 96, mm -hmm. we had the major storm, but following that, um, we didn't have anything close to the uh, July 2013 storm, um, or I mean the April 2013 storm until that occurred. And then, you know, this following October, that was a significant event as well. Well, and this one also had four days of rain leading into it which ex exasperated the saturation, which it sounds like is what caused the majority of this problem is the, the ground just couldn't take any more water. It definitely um, adds to the problem for sure. The, uh, the homes near the Aurora 
sports complex are in, located in the floodplain, correct? Uh, some of those homes? Well, some of them are, are in the regulatory floodplain, and some of them would be in the area that we think are going to be prone to flooding, but it's not a recorded floodplain right now. But again, we use that as best available data. Are any of the homes on Bryan Lane or Troon in a floodplain? All right. Any other questions? Go ahead, Stan. Well, a comment. In the summary that you provided, which is extensive and helpful, you do kind of recommend moving ahead with alternative one. <clears throat> is that something we should be discussing now? That's the one we have completed. So one, we did get all that work okay. done, and it was effective. Again, I, I know it's not as effective as it people would like, but it did make a difference from the, based on our observations. 2013. The question now is whether we move forward with an alternative five, possibly alter or alternative seven, or possibly an alternative eight. Okay. And um, if the board directs, we would look closer at those and come back. <clears throat> and again, we want to um, look at those in, in comparison to what IDOT's proposing as well, so we kind of have a little bit of a idea of what uh, they they're going to do and how that affects us. Um, and then. We can always remove that from the equation and anal analyze it as well, so that um, you know we know that we're responding to solving the problem, um, you know, not waiting. Because I don't think any of us can predict when the state may have funding for the uh, Ad Lane pro project on Thursday. Not in five years, probably. Probably not. No. Uh, and how many homes do we know of that took on water or actually had, other than the pumps running? had wa standing water in their basement? I can't answer that, uh, Mayor. Um, <coughs> it's a little bit difficult to quantify. Um, we had only 13 residences reach out to us during that storm, including two that we knew took on overland flow, as uh, Engineer Waller stated. Um, a few of those were not even in Montgomery. The residents were confused about their location within a township boundary and not served by our storm water system. So that was 13 village wide or in this 13 area? 13 contacts, residential contacts yeah. during that storm. Reportedly through social media and other avenues, we've learned that there are many more homes that could not keep up um, or their sump pumps could not keep up, but they did not reach out to us. So I don't have those listed. Okay. Pete, you keep alluding to this um, information that we're eventually going to receive from the state. Do you think that we're going to get that in the next few weeks? I don't know when we're going to get it. What I've been told is, is that it was close to being approved. Um, I s frankly thought I'd get it. We would have it before now. Um, so I've somewhat given up trying to predict what I may or may not do. So I, I can't really answer. At one point, we thought they would be done with their entire phase one project by now. And that was years ago, though. On that general topic, um, they've asked the village to um, go through and discuss um, and give recommendations back on elements that need to be included in the phase two uh, recommendations. And these are items that we've already discussed with you, but we're going to come back one more time and go over them. And I'll give you an example. One is to discuss the, the lighting along the corridor. And you may recall we went through that. And you know I think we're generally in agreement that we were going to do it at the intersections only. Well, they they want concurrence on those type of elements. But they also want us to, to give concurrence on the entire design. Well, we're frankly, I don't think we want we're reluctant to bring that before you before we have the drainage because the drainage was important for a number of things. One, we're concerned about this area, certainly. But on the east of Orchard, we're also concerned with the Montgomery overflow and the proposed storm sewer they were going to put along 30, which was um, purported to be a 60-inch. We wanted to confirm that. Uh, verbally, I've been told that that's still in the design and it's actually a 72-inch. But, um, but we wanted to confirm that. And then also recall that the state had a habit of putting stormwater detention along the corridor in areas of prime commercial. And so we're certainly not going to sign off on the design, the phase one uh, report, until we see all of that. 
Uh, but our intention is when we have that, then to bring it back to the board to go over all of the items, uh, the drainage, the project, um, you know, items that they've asked for, which is lighting and um, landscaping, and I, I can't remember all of them now. But uh, so that's a work item that's still out there uh, before then that, that they will actually finalize the project design report. But um, so we need that drainage. <coughs> The, long, the short answer is probably not. We're not going to get that. Rel we can't really rel wait. We'll sit around and wait. I'm Hopefully gonna, we'll get it. You know, we're certainly going to reach out again to them, which I've done, honestly, every about two weeks I'll call the uh, project manager for IDOT and just inquire. And it, it is beyond that person's control as well because it goes into different um, divisions in IDOT. And this particular division is the hydraulics unit, and they – take whatever time they feel is necessary to do the review, and even the project manager at IDOT doesn't control that. So that's what we're waiting on right now. And there may be other things going on that we're just not privy to in terms of back and forth between the uh, designers that we're just not aware of. When you say discussion, uh, do you mean uh, when it goes in the budget? I mean, are you looking... Uh, are you looking for a discussion on when we would like to have this done? I mean, is it going to be like in April, which would be now, if we had money left? Or are you looking at next year's budget? Or what are you? Well, I think what a couple hundred thousand, I think say. What we're looking for is the directive to continue planning, to go through these other alternatives, come up with what we think is the best alternative, bring it back to you for discussion, and then ultimately <coughs> let the budget for construction, if again, if this is what you want us to do, want to do, we would budget for construction in next um, spring, which would be the next fiscal year. So we would put an amount in the budget for this, would be the intent. Yeah. So it seems like... Go ahead. No, it seems like there's definitely more work to do. I mean, the solution hasn't been identified yet. We've looked at this in 2013. We, they've updated some stuff now, uh, but there's definitely more work to be done here. I think we proceed with that reach out to ComEd just so they at least understand what's going on. Um, the, the one point that I, I feel obligated to make is that, um, you know, this flooding situation is, is relatively very localized, right? It could be a dozen houses. Is that a safe estimate? Or 20 houses? <laughs> Again, that's, I mean, it's really difficult to... Yeah. Put a number on the 13 contacts we had were village wide, and some of those two or three were outside the village. Yeah. So, from that neighborhood specifically, or Brian Lane, uh, only four homes mm -hmm. come to mind off that list. And nobody on the on Rebecca reached out. Is that Rebecca to the east? Correct. On the other side no, of the easement. We, it was all on Brian Lane. Uh, there was one in on Troon. We did have some inquiries from Foxmore and Fairfield. I mean, it, it was widespread throughout the community. So very, very limited number of contacts. Now, that's not to say that certain homeowners just might not see the need to make public works aware of their individual situation. It's hard to say how many homes were experiencing water in their basements. I know I spoke with five or six in a line down Bryan Lane, so I'm sure they probably didn't all reach out to you, but I know there were at least five or six. Listen, the reg residents, I would say eight to ten total, okay. right? But correct around there. And on the Re on, in reference to the Rebecca side of that, yeah, I don't think there was. That seems to be, and Brent, you folks live there. It seems higher. Mm -hmm. That west side of that easement mm -hmm. seems to be considerably higher than the. The east side, I'm sorry. The yeah, I'm not That's a good point as well. Yeah. Uh, so the only comment that I was going to make with the amount in the homes was that it's a, it, arguably a $140,000 fix for stormwater problems for 10 homes. And it, I'm not saying that it's something we should or shouldn't do. I just wanted to at least make that point, that it's a significant... Um, cost to install all this storm sewer that that we would see benefits of in the 50 to 100 year storm event, which I know everybody talks like we're getting a lot more, and I think we are. 
um, but it would be a rare instance when the, this improvement is being um, utilized. So I just need to at least state that. Um, but we're going to do everything that we can to improve the situation. And I think we're halfway down the road, and we just need to finish, look at all the, other, all the options, see what ComEd has to say, and bring it back in the future. My goal is to um, have Engineer Wallers continue looking at alternatives five or seven and bring those back to us sometime in the next few months. That way we can make a decision and get something scheduled for construction in, in spring of next year. That would be our goal. I mean, it, it, yes, the benefit may be to 10 or 12 houses, but there are 10 or 12 houses that aren't in a floodplain. And they've, you know, they're dealing with water issues. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you've stood in the basement, so have I. Yeah, I'm not saying it's an insignificant problem. I'm just highlighting the fact that, um, and the other thing, too, is this wouldn't, well, we're going to do everything we can do to look at this, look at all the options, see what the best solution is. All right. Moving on to the most exciting item, the proposed chlorine residual standard revision. Who's taking that one? Pete? Yeah. So I'm going to have to can. Um, the um, EPA is currently uh, proposing changes to the chlorine residual standard that um, all communities in Illinois have to follow. And depending on whether you're a uh, combined chlorine community or a um, free chlorine community, the standard would change slightly. But in our case, um, we're free free chlorine. So right now we're required to uh, have a residual amount of chlorine in the system of 0 0.2 milligrams per liter. That's throughout the entire system. So I think all of you are well aware that um, from time to time there's been some struggles maintaining consistent chlorine levels throughout the community. And the village has gone and put in chlorine analyzers and more sophisticated equipment so that we can respond as the chlorine demand changes, we can adjust the amount of chlorine that goes in. And I believe that we're doing a pretty good job of that right now. The water department has really uh, done a great job of uh, maintaining and analyzing and, and doing a better job of having consistent chlorine levels. Well, again, the state is now proposing that that 0.2 milligram per liter would be raised to 0.5 milligram. And um, the Illinois State American Water Works Association, which is, um, I would say, the foremost um, trade uh, organization for water supply, uh, most of all of our um, water operators or members, has looked at this. They have a, a special subgroup, if you will, that, that's considered this. And they believe that going to that standard is unnecessary unwarranted. Um, and it, in fact, it's going to cause more issues relative to customer complaints and cost than is really um, benefiting the community. There are some nuances in that we can talk about, but it's the water staff's opinion here and uh, frankly throughout most of the water system that this standard is, is just beyond uh, what is necessary. So. Um, Illinois State American Water Works Association has sent out to all their membership two sample letters that could be used to file an objection to the standard. It's being uh, heard before the Illinois Pollution Control Board. And we've also sent the same uh, sample letters out to all the Metro West communities. It's our recommendation that we file an objection uh, with the Illinois Pollution Control Board that that standard not be increased because we don't believe it adds anything to the benefit of the public health and we think it'll have more uh, issues relative to the village operating and maintaining their system. So um, we can go through the um, specifics of, of why uh, we object to it, but I don't want to um, um, go through that if, if uh, that's not required. Uh, also, just to point out that there's only a few states that go to that level of standard. Uh, 
I think it's four states out of 50. Um, so the majority of the, of the states are either using the 0.2 milligrams per liter standard or something less than that. So is there any data that shows that this would actually be healthier? We don't, we, we could not find any. And that's part of the, the objection, the reason yeah. why uh, AWWA I did a little studying and reading after seeing this and having a conversation with Todd earlier in the week. And this sounds to me like there's some communities somewhere that aren't meeting the standards of what's required and what's, what's best practice. And so now the state wants to come in with a, what I refer to as an unfunded state mandate to require everybody to do, and we're already doing this stuff. We're doing the right things, and we're replacing our lead service lines. We're doing the right things, and now the state is going to come in and throw a blanket over everybody instead of just going to whatever little town that is out of compliance and making them get into compliance. And I just I completely support us standing up and fighting against this because, again, I think we're doing the right things, and we're doing what our best practices for our residents and living out on the west side, in order to maintain this residual, I mean, if you live near the, Stan lives out near the water treatment plant, his level is gonna have to be about 1.4 in order for it to be 0.5 in Boulder Hill. Well, just, I mean, common sense tells you that, obviously, if you go from 0.2 to 0.5, you gotta increase to 0.3 everywhere, and that's gonna be noticed. Yeah, nobody's calling up asking for more chlorine smell and taste in their water, that's for sure. But if there was a health you know, benefit to it and it was clearly healthier, then that would make one thing. Was the AWWA have a seat at the table for these conversations at all? It seems like the waterworks operators would be uh, good ones to be involved in this. They're certainly um, filing the, their own objection as well. Uh, but again, we think it's going to be a larger impact when all the municipalities uh, object to it. Yeah. No objections with EPA or with the Illinois Pollution Control Board. If there was sound science that this was healthier, you know, the unfunded mandates, you know, kind of irrelevant then that it's required. It's what we need to do, but it doesn't appear to be as much. So, no, I, I feel like I'm drinking a swimming pool right now. If you double it up, it would be like. I, I couldn't keep my wife from coming here. She right now would love to come down and jump Todd about the chlorine now because, I mean, it smells, the whole the whole bathroom smells like a swimming pool when you're done, and I'm going, this is just way too much chlorine. But we, we're bringing bottled water to drink, but it's, if you doubled it up, I'll guarantee you're going to get a lot of people that are not going to be happy with it. No, we, we fully, I, I, quite honestly, every community fully understands that. Just, let's just also, you know, be clear that the standard, um, you can go as high as two milligrams per liter uh, in, in terms of uh, not having any impact on public health. However, most people, some people are more sensitive to it than others, obviously. And, you know, 0.2 pre-chlorine is sufficient to do what is intended, which is to protect the system from... Um, any intrusions when you have drop in pressure or uh, any bacteria that might somehow get into the system. That's the intent. Um, we don't believe that there's any additional benefit by going up to a higher standard. Awesome. Let's proceed. Is there value at this point for public input? Well, certainly anybody that would like to can file a objection with the Illinois Pollution Control Board. That, that process is open. Um, we, we're we asking that we get these letters in before November 16th because that's the next public hearing that's going to be held in Chicago and we'd like to have that on the record for that. Uh, but the um, record will be open for some time for people to make comment if they'd like. Maybe that could be a posting on our website for people that are interested. It would be a great Facebook post. Facebook, yeah. Since Facebook seems to be... So, so great at <laughs> motivating people, and especially on the west side where we had all those folks come to that water meeting with concerns about the smell of the water. It would be great. All right. Object. Any new or unfinished business? Uh, I noticed. You noticed. I'm glad you know all guys on those green and gold. 
All you Bears fan. I didn't That's even all I wanted to say. Another play. <laughs> all right, uh, moving on. The committee of the whole meeting on I the twenty-first. One item. Hello. <laughs> was canceled, and then we'll move back to newer and finished, as long as it's not sports. Please. <laughs> so I had the opportunity this morning to serve as principal for a day at Nicholson Elementary. It was a fantastic time. I had a lot of fun. Um, the chief also participated in principal for a day. I don't know if you wanted to share where you were this morning. Yes, thank you. Uh, I was at um, Black Hawk campus. That is um, on North Randall Road, north of Sullivan. That's pretty much uh, West Aurora Success Academy, they call it. So it's um, a very eye-opening experience for myself, but I was there for a few hours this morning also. Yes, it was a very good experience. Very awesome. Cool. Thank you. I heard you expelled two students. How I roll. All right, next village board meeting two weeks from tonight at 7 p.m. That will go into executive session to discuss an employment of an employee. And pending or threatened litigation. And pending or threatened litigation. All right, I didn't take a motion. I want to add that. Hmm? Yeah. Need a motion? Apparently not. Somebody asked for one. Sure. 